Okay, we will talk about this next week more, but as far as action potential, I want you to keep in mind that um, uh, this is from physiology, and these are the electrodes, um, um, uh, electrolytes that are involved, in, and so any change in these electrolytes will affect the rhythm of the ECG. We'll talk about ECG in details for next week. The same thing with the conduction system. And the conduction system, you know that it's it's uh, uh, consists of mainly the SA node, which is in the right atrium, and then the AV node, which is between the atria and the ventricle, and then of course we have the bundle of Hess and then the Purkinje fibers. One of the major thing. Um, for the cardiovascular system, in order to have an optimal functions, you need to have a normal heart, normal blood vessels, and normal blood volume. So blood vessels, again, the patency of the blood vessels is extremely important. This is a normal blood vessel, as you see here, so the circulation will be normal. Any changes in the viscosity of the blood or changes in the diameter of the um, uh, blood vessel itself or in the vasoconstriction, vasodilation or accumulation of lipids or uh, clot, uh, blood clots, all that can affect the perfusion. And the perfusion is the one of the major or the major outcome of a cardiovascular system. As long as the, the tissues, they have normal circulation, normal perfusion, then we'll have normal functions. This is another thing that, you know, as, uh, the, the balance between the pressures, uh, the intracellular pressure and the extracellular pressure. Remember, what we mean by extracellular mainly is the, blood's, the blood pressure. And then the extracellular, is, uh, intracellular is the blood within the cells itself. There should be a balance between the pressure inside the blood, which basically depends. We have the hydrostatic pressure, which depends on the blood volume. And we also we have the encodic or the colloid pressure, which depends on the protein and mainly albumin. And so for a patient uh, who with edema, what happens here, there's an imbalance in this pressure. For example, lack of albumin will, will affect the uh, oncotic pressure. And then so the fluids start going toward the cells, and that's why you see edema. Another thing uh, very important is the lipoproteins. We talked about that a little bit in farm, but you know that LDL and, and HDL and the balance in between these cholesterols, we know that LDL is the bad cholesterol, and if it's uh, in high concentration in the blood, it can lead to atherosclerosis, uh, while the L LDL is a um, healthy cholesterol because it takes the cholesterol to the liver, while the LDL, it brings it, brings it to the blood vessels and again accumulation of cholesterol in the blood vessels can lead to atherosclerosis which will affect the diameter and again and therefore the circulation of the blood in the blood vessels another uh, now I want to introduce a few things so this is as far as pathophysi uh, anatomy physiology now let's add a little bit of biochemistry here just remember that within the myocytes there is a specific uh, protein uh, that's actually our enzyme that's only available in the heart, uh, and it's it's called troponin. Troponin it, it has a function to bring the actin and myosin and tryptomycin together to create a contraction in the circulation in the coronary circulation. So this is troponin. If there's an infarction and if the cells start to die, then troponin will be released in the blood. Okay, so increase of troponin level, it's an indication of a myocardial injury, okay, or, or infarction, or it's an MI. So keep this picture in mind again, as long as uh, the cells are healthy and alive within the heart, then the troponin will be co intact. If the cell starts to die, troponin will leave, and then you will see it on the bloodstream as elevation and troponin. The other thing I want to talk about is the uh, the peptides that uh, the uh, ventricles and the uh, atria release when they stretch. 
These peptides are, are, are within the myocytes. Uh, one of them, the ANP, it's done the A4 atria. It's actually within the atria. So whenever the atria uh, stretch because they are trying to overcome an increase in the fluid or because um, there is a high resistance, so uh, whenever there's a stretch, they will release, they release this peptides. The, the PNP is released mainly from the ventricles, and this is what this is more serious because you know that the cardiac output means ventricles. The atria are more of containers. They receive the blood, and they they just pass it down to the ventricles. The ventricles are these, whether it's right or left ventricles, they do the major job. So whenever there's an increase in the PNP, that means that the ventricles are struggling. So that's why we use PNP for heart failure as an indicator of how well the heart failure is managed or how worse the prognosis of heart failure at this point. The other thing I like to introduce is the nitri nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a molecule that's actually now naturally available in the blood stream and it's actually it's within the uh, cells, the uh, mu the uh, skeletal muscles that uh, control the vasoconstriction and vasodilation. The major function or the major effect of nitric oxide is vasodilation. Vasodilation. So whenever there's a need for vasodilation, whether because there's a spasm or a clot, the skeletal muscles will release a uh, nitric oxide and that will cause vasodilation. In fact, that's what is nitroglycerin is about. Nitroglycerin mainly it's nitric oxide. So whenever the nitric oxide it's not enough in the natural, then we can give the patient nitric oxide externally to in, to induce vasodilation in case of severe vasoconstriction or coronary occlusion. Okay, there's a few terms of hemodynamics I'd like to introduce. Well, you're gonna hear it later. Uh, and let's start with, so we have stroke volume, cardiac output, preload, afterload, systemic vascular resistance. Of course, we're going to talk about blood pressure and the mean arterial pressure. And we'll talk about how we calculate that, pulse pressure also. Let's start with the stroke volume. Well, stroke volume, basically, it is the amount of blood that the heart ejects every single beat. And this is normally is about 70 milliliters. This is about 70 milliliters every beat. So that's the amount of it. So this is an important indicator of the cardiac output. Stroke volume is important indicator of, of cardiac output. So normally it's about 70 milliliters. When, whenever um, there is uh, any factor that decreases the blood volume, then the stroke volume will be low. For example, bleeding, dehydration. For any reason, if the CV, if CVB is low or the venous return, to the right ventricle or right atrium first, then stroke volume will be low. Now I say that stroke volume is an important indicator for cardiac output because technically by calculation cardiac output is the stroke volume times the heart rate. So therefore the cardiac output is actually the stroke volume. We say stroke volume is the amount every beat. Now times these beats then the total will be the uh, stroke volume times heart rate. So let's say if the stroke volume is 70 and the heart rate is 70, so that's about 4,900 milliliters per minute. We go, or we say 4.9 liter per minute. The normal um, uh, cardiac output for an adult is 4 to 6 liters per minute. Okay. Now again, based on this uh, calculation, the cardiac output will depend on the stroke volume and the heart rate. And also it depends on the systemic vascular resistance, we'll talk about it in a second. Now the preload, what we mean by the preload is basically the amount of uh, stretching that the ventricles will have to assume or to contract just before they push the blood. So there's a preload for the left ventricle and there's a preload for the right ventricles. But always, whenever you see preload in books, we mean it by, mainly we need, we mean by it the um, right ventricle preload. And this totally depends on the amount of, of, of blood that the uh, veins will bring back to the right atrium. So technically uh, or clinically, the way we measure preload, uh, we have what's called central venous pressure. And the central venous pressure, again, it's a measurement of the pressure in the right atrium. It is a measurement of the pressure in the right atrium, and this pressure is caused by the amount or the volume of uh, venous return that comes from the, the uh, superior and inferior vena cava. A preload is an indication of a fluid status. Preload 
is an indication of fluid status. So see, when the preload is high, which means the CVP is high, that means the patient is ha having too much fluid, overload, maybe fluid overload. When the preload is low, or the CVP is low, that means the patient has less fluid, could be dehydration or bleeding. Okay, now let's talk about the regulation of cardiovascular system. Again, a cardiovascular system consists of blood pressure, sorry, uh, the heart, the blood, and the blood vessels. Now, for example, the blood vessels, I'll give you an example. Uh, in the blood vessels, we have the alpha 1 and alpha 2 and beta 1 and beta, and, and beta, 1 and beta 2 in the heart. So, for example, blood vessels, when you have the alpha being inactivated, that's when you will see a vasodilation. Now, with vasodilation, as you see, the diameter will be large and the amount of blood that flow, uh, flows during, uh, through these blood vessels will be high. Whenever there is an activation for the alpha 1, for example, the alpha 1 or adrenergic or agonist, uh, perceptor, uh, receptor, um, then that will lead to vasoconstriction. As you see, the vasoconstriction the dia diameter is smaller and therefore the amount of a blood that flows in a vasoconstricted blood vessel will be low. And we, you learn in, in farm about uh, beta, beta, the activation of beta adrenergic receptors in the heart and the alpha 2 uh, effect on the blood vessels. Okay, now the afterload is another concept we'll talk about. And again, the afterload refers mainly to the tension of the stress that the left ventricle um, will assume or have to um, develop in order to overcome the resistance within the blood vessels. Okay, and that's what we refer to uh, the systemic vascular resistance. So again, this is just before the ejection, just before the left ventricle eject the blood. It is connected to blood vessels. So, whenever these blood vessels, uh, they dilated, which means that the resistance is less, that means the amount of tension that the left ventricle needs to create, it's low. And that's why, that's how would the heart be. Uh, less less uh, systemic resistance, that means less pressure the heart will need to create, while when there is a vasoconstriction which increase the systemic vascular resistance, that means now the heart, the left ventricle, the left ventricle has more pressure or more resistance to overcome, and that's why the, uh, in this case, the afterload will be high. So the afterload, again, mainly it's managed or depends on the Vasoconstriction and vasodilation it depends on the resistance of the blood vessels, and that's why some of the medication that we give for the patient or the outcome of this medication when you create a vasodilation is to decrease the vasoconstriction, which means to decrease the systemic vascular resistance and make it easier for the left ventricle to push the blood. Let's talk about the blood pressure. Now, the blood pressure depends on the cardiac output as well as the systemic vascular resistance. Now, the cardiac output depends on stroke volume and heart rate, and the, the systemic vascular resistance depends on the, uh, the vasoconstriction, vasovasodilation. Now, remember that the, in the cardiac beat or cardiac circulation, systolic is one, uh, one, one half or one third, actually, one third of the time of the circulation, while the diastolic is two times. So let's say if the heart beats, is or the circulation is three seconds. One second will be systole, or and the two second will be diastole. Now, that's why we came up with what we call MAP. MAP is not an average. MAP or the mean arterial pressure is not an average of systolic uh, and diastolic. We, we take into consideration the time of these uh, both, um, you know, systolic and diastolic. The equation of MAP is actually the systole. Time plus two times the diastole, all together divided by three, or one third of the stall plus two thirds of the diastole, because one third of time is systole and two thirds of the diastole. So, for example, if you have a blood pressure of 130 over 90, that map will be 130 plus two times 90, which together 180, all together divided by three. So you get a map of 103. Now. The map, the significance of map is important when you have a wide pulse of pressure. And you know, pulse of pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Now, as you see in this, for example, in this example, is 130 over 90. This is what we call prehypertension. Now, you can decide, you can see that both 
um, you know, systolic is slightly high and diastolic is within the range. But when you have a blood pressure of 140 over 60, for example, the systole indicates like high and while the diastole is low. So which way you go? And how do you know if there's enough perfusion or not? And that's why you need to uh, get the map. So the map, uh, whenever the map is above 60, that means there's uh, enough perfusion. And so the cells will be in good shape. For whatever reason, if the map is below 60, that means the circulation is poor and that can have some serious consequences. Now, the pulse pressure simply is the difference between systolic and diastolic pr blood, uh, blood pressure. And then the, there are some cases where we have this pulse pressure become wide. So, in this example, if you have a blood pressure of 190 over, 120 over 90, then pulse pressure simply is 30. It's the difference between them, and that's within normal. But if you have a patient with a blood pressure of 160 over 80, that gives you a blood pressure of 80, which is high. And that's something, can you see it as in, in case of the increased demands of metabolic demands like exercise? But also you can see it in patients with atherosclerosis, where the, during systole, the heart has to work harder to make sure that the uh, circulation is, um, um, or the cardiac output is within normal. And if you have a patient with a blood pressure of 100 over 80, that gives you a narrow pulse of pressure of only 20. And that's something you can see in patients with heart failure and patients with hypovolemia. So normally it should be between 40 and 50. Um, so again, narrow pulse pressure or wide pulse pressure, especially wide pulse pressure, um, it, it has its clinical significance.